look, I know I have no one to blame but myself. All right, what was I thinking telling myself that I could do a third edition of covering women's extreme wrestling and not go crazy from it, from how awful it is? This isn't some little story, oh, I'm an internet critic, I'm being made to do this by some outside force. No, I chose to do this because I knew that, oh, talking about it might be funny, but you have to watch it first, and the reason it's funny is because it's so damn bad. Why do I do it? I guess you could say I, I do it for the content. Because I sure as hell don't do it for my sanity. The first time around, I reviewed the first four WEW pay-per-views. Then for some reason in part two, I jumped ahead to volumes nine through 12. But then there's that fun middle area, that period of time when WEW tried, albeit very little, to grow out of a company that was just doing bra and panties matches or dildo and a pole matches and turn into more of a legitimate wrestling league for women. But it's safe to say at this point, <laughs> they ain't there yet. So without any further ado, let's jump back a little on the timeline and visit episodes five through eight. Just a warning, since part two included some best of shows, ha! There will be a segment or two here that was previously covered back in 2020. But don't worry, because if there's one thing that makes this crap better, it's repeat viewings. We begin with show number five, AKA Deep Impact, which first aired in November of 2002. <laughs> After all this time, I have to admit, that opening theme is pretty catchy. I hum it to myself all the time. Dub it up, 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 dub it up. Please help me. I've never thought about it until now, but who the hell designed this awful first draft of the WEW logo? Just what exactly is going on with the middle of this background? Like, okay, I see lips and some chains, maybe a pelvis, a spur. And is that a pair of boobs that don't seem to be attached to anyone in particular, or a different set of lips from a different angle? Who can tell when the logo's at like half opacity? And shouldn't there be an apostrophe here? And don't even get me started on the smaller version in the corner. Good luck making anything out there. I tackle the important issues. We find ourselves back at Froggy's in Dover, Delaware, a bar that also hosted a few CZW shows back in 01 that has since closed down. And I'm sure you're gonna see, as always, which WEW Women's Extreme Wrestling is famous for its plenty of tits and ass. Ah, well, if it isn't Jeffrey J. James, <laughs> goody. <laughs> now I can put a face to it all. Things look very hot in the building as he and Eric Gargiulo kick things off. Then we wipe to Riptide, the former prodigette in late era ECW, cutting a promo on her opponent, Alexis Lurie. The ECW reference is pretty apropos because they try really hard to cop their aesthetic throughout. All this back and forth camera movement is giving me a freaking headache. You are gonna get your little face bashed in. Well, that was a little bit hard to get through for a couple of reasons, but now we can finally get on with the red. Wait, what is happening now? Look at this. Oh, man. Whoa, baby. Look at that. Look at that. Whoa, bam. Bam. Folks, we are two minutes in. Later tonight, I'll be crunching on a sweet little midget. Huh, looks like MJF isn't the first person to have cut a promo while eating a pickle. Isis returns as the head referee as she dances and dances and dances. And folks, who needs to knock the production when our boy Jeff does it himself? What's with the different levels of, uh, this, this picture's dark here and some of the pictures are bright. I mean, what's going on here? What's, what's Schwartz overexposed in his camera? Then out comes Tara, best known for cheating in and still losing a bra and panties match at the ECW arena against Candy, the pickle girl from earlier. You can tell she's the heel because she's wearing pants. She kicks Isis out and the opening match of Candy and Little Louie, the crotch sniffer from earlier, versus BJ and King Sleazy. Yes, THE King Sleazy from Jerry Lawler's Survivor Series team in 1994. Same gear and everything. And oh yeah, a competitor named BJ. Gosh, do you think that- That is BJ, and we know how I feel about BJ's hair. Wow, they literally did it faster than I could say, do you think they'll make a joke about it? After all that entrance, we still cut ahead to the match actually starting with a bite on the butt. As Candy gets worn down in the ring, Garjula lets the mask slip a little. Jeff, you don't need much training to compete in WEW. Exactly. At one point, the guys just enter the ring without tagging, and Louie hits Sleazy with a cup of beer. Candy hits the single greatest rock bottom I've ever seen, then pants BJ to win the match. The King tries to strip Candy after the bell, but Tara stops him from doing so, I'm guessing because she forgot she was a heel? On we go to Riptide 
versus Alexis Lurie, who had been part of WEW since their very first show in Philly. I will never stop being gobsmacked that the future Mickey James was involved with this show. Is this how fans of the original Glow feel about Ivory? Tara pretty much plays it neutral as ref this time around, and the match is much more straightforward. The commentary, which often comes off in this show as crude and at times misogynistic, seems considerably tamer when the actual workers are in the ring, though they still chastise Lurie for wearing a swimsuit bottom and not a thong. I mean, you would think they'd have that written in the contract. The match is called a Stairway to Supremacy match with no explanation of what that is. There's a ladder involved, but nothing above the ring to grab. They climb up both sides of a one-sided ladder, which legitimately made me gasp for fear of it breaking before they both go tumbling down. Riptide takes a great face bump into the ladder, and Alexis has the match won until Tara suddenly remembers she's a baddie. Riptide hits the super kick and gets the win. For the standard set by this promotion, this was a terrific match in all honesty. We dissolved backstage where, oh, this guy still? The smoke says to one of his hoes, you're not gonna show those tits tonight. You're not. The Smoke is the commissioner of WEW and tells Cinnamon that she's not allowed to show her breasts to the crowd tonight. Man, what is WEW's mission statement anyway? Do they want to sell sex or don't they? And another thing, if you do, where'd he go? By the way, talk about missing out on a golden opportunity. They could have said the Smoke's real name was Peter Johnson, long lost brother of Dwayne, now to be known as The Cock. I mean, in this organization, why not? We get a box wipe to a cat bite of sorts between Casey and Missy the schoolgirl who have been thoughtfully given a double name graphic. This is one of those moments they brought up in the best of pay-per-views I already covered. They enter, they gently push each other around, they leave. Then we jump right to the big match between Davy May and Cinnamon, where Davy gets to do anything he wants to her if he wins, gross, and Cinnamon gets to show her boobs to the fans if she wins, yay! Man, this match is worse than I remember it being. Not like the worst, but they're definitely trying to punch above their weight so to speak. Also, how did I only now notice that some of the turnbuckle pads are connected to the ring post via chains? That looks not right. Oh! She's going nuts! There she goes! goes! That other personality, Jeff! She's going out of her mind! We get Cinnamon's Hulk up in the form of a psychotic episode, trying to hit her needlessly elaborate finisher and messing it up both times. Then he brief flashed the crowd before she wins the match. We cut to a stand-up with Eric and Jeffrey, who discuss the schoolgirl brawl from two segments ago. I mean, they were going crazy, them schoolgirls. They're like, you know what, though, them schoolgirls are like the, the girls you knew in school. The two also pout about not being able to see Cinnamon's breasts. Put the heat on the baby face. That that's the ticket. We move ahead to Chick Diesel, accompanied by Special Ed, taking on the American Cream Pie, whose gimmick is spraying whipped cream into the fans' mouths and then making out with them, which... Hmm... Okay. I don't get the design on the back of Diesel's shirt. Who was him? As seen in the previous video, Special Ed is a loudmouthed manager with a congenital disorder that affects the way he walks and moves around, but not how he talks. Who do you send to take her out? Mercedes. Who? Exactly. Mercedes? You're more like a Pinto. That's what I think. No kidding. He's actually one of the better promos in the entire lineup. He's a lot better than the smoke. Out come American Cream Pie and Ed's rival, another man with a disability named Lucky. Lucky immediately eats shit at ringside. Then when he finally enters the ring, he gets the ever-loving crap beaten out of him, all while ACP just walks around making out with the crowd the whole time. She finally gets the hint and tries to make the save, but is laid out as well. Commentary chastises her for her choice in underwear, a five-star segment. What is she wearing, granny panties? Oh, no, but she, her ass ain't too bad, Eric. It's a lot better when it's covered. <laughs> the ring announcer has completely lost his voice as we go to our next contest, Persephone taking on Don May, accompanied by Papa May, who spits potato chips all over the crowd. Nice. Easy for him to say, Jeff. Just when I thought that the match wouldn't be half bad, we get a frightening looking head scissors. Somehow Dawn gets blinded despite nothing touching her eyes and takes an eternity to realize she's attacking her own man. Persephone hits a DDT for the win and so ends one of the worst matches I've ever seen. So far. On we go to the semi-main event as G.I. Ho defends the WEW world title against Lady Storm. I love how Storm is the heel, but she at least has the courtesy to get Ho's attention and turn her around to fight. 
What about in Desert Storm, Jeff, when she was taken prisoner in Baghdad? Was she even old enough to be in uh, Desert Storm? Sure she was, Jeff. This is a match that was later featured on the Best of G.I. Ho pay-per-view, which I talked about in my previous WEW episode. It features a crowd brawl that actually looks like a simulated fight and not just two ladies pushing each other into the fans' laps. The match ends when Ho leaps from the ring to the outside to get the win. Off the top she goes! And this guy, though, you see that guy trying to grab her ass? Flying Ho! Are you surprised? That's literally the culture of the entire promotion. You said so earlier. Tits and ass! The croc comes in with Steve the sound guy, and together the two beat up the champion, until Ty Killer Weed and her pal Psycho Bitch make the save. Wow, even here the champion gets mid-carded by the real star of the promotion. This intergender main event war goes all over the place, even to the parking lot outside, where the ladies lightly spank Smoke and quietly talk smack to him. Oh, oh she's talking some trash. To talking some smack. The match finally ends when G.I. Ho returns to hit a splash on the Smoke, followed up with a somewhat less impressive splash by Psycho Bitch. Evil has been vanquished for at least the next month. Huh, okay, well, that first show was bad, but at least I had already seen a few of those segments beforehand. It can't get much worse than this though, right? Episode 6 is called Kickin' Ass Ghetto Booty Style, sure. In this intro, we learn that apparently WEW now stands for Women's Erotic Wrestling. Well, I guess that depends on your definition of at least two of those words. Oh, and there are more lyrics to the opening song now. More intelligible than I thought it'd be. Ty Killer Weed opens the show and lets everyone know what the Fed really stands for. Women eat weed. Then we see Casey, aka Annie Social, which they seemingly use interchangeably going forward, telling her friend how hot she is compared to the rest of the roster. And this is, you know you want to touch us. You know you do. And at least my is real. Wow, dialogue taken straight from the big leagues. They're going to be missing out on these big voluptuous breasts. Gargiulo rides solo as he breaks down the show's big matches, Joey Styles, uh, style. We're informed that the Ghetto Girls, whoever they are, might show up tonight. Well, based on the title of this pay-per-view, I would certainly hope so. After more Iris dancing, we get another rambling Riptide promo on Amy Lee. Then we hear one from Persephone in response to a promo we haven't seen, nor will we ever see. Persephilis, huh? That wasn't pretty intelligent. What is it? Cameo? Camel toe, camel ho. And then we hear from Amy Lee in response to the Riptide promo. What in the hell's the cameraman looking at with these quick looks down? I'm gonna knock the ovaries right out of you. I make the rules, I break the rules. The opening contest sees newcomer Cameo take on Persephone, who has put on some mass since the last time we saw her, if you get my drift. Appropriately, she ends the match with an implant DDT. Subtle. Tara shows up again to talk about how beautiful she is, all while looking anywhere but into a camera's lens. Suddenly, Casey and her friend Crystal interrupt. They try to strip Tara, then they just stop and Tara powders. Oh, and evidently that was supposed to be a best bodies contest? Great! I love when things don't make sense. So now about these ghetto girls? What's with these ghetto girls? Are they here yet? Oh man, I know! Like, what's with them? And who are they? And what are they coming for? And why should we care? Hope the payoff for this is good. It's time for a paddle match as Missy the schoolgirl takes on Lady Storm. If Storm wins, she gets to paddle Missy, but if Missy wins, the smoke has to paddle Lady Storm. So, Missy herself would get nothing? Smoke cuts his rip-off rock promo, then Lady Storm gets a chance to speak. Gargiulo talks over her, calling her Maya Angelou. Gee, I wonder why that name came up. Tara has come back and joins Eric on commentary, if you want to call it that since she's barely audible. During the match, Missy decks her opponent with headshots that Hulk Hogan and Lance Storm ought to learn from. There are several jarring pixel wipes during this matchup. At one point, they actually knock down a light with a ladder. Ooh, Mr. Froggy won't like that. Describe the feeling, the sensation of your back against steel like a ladder. Let me tell you this, it doesn't feel good. Wow, such gripping analysis. After another pixel wipe, the smoke is teleported into the Tree of Woe position and gets a table dropkicked into his face. Missy climbs the ladder and grabs her prize, a paddle that seems to be missing its string and rubber ball on the other end of it. So Missy wins, which means the smoke has to spank his own colleague, but of course he won't go through with it on account of him being a bad old heel. Instead, he tells the sexy nurses at ringside to paddle Missy instead. So they grab Missy and give a little spank, and they all laugh it off like it didn't matter. Okay. 
Obviously it didn't matter, but you know what I mean. The smoke pops right back in and is joined by the sound guy. Steve berates the sexy ringside nurses, then manhandles them, and the ladies just laugh it off like they do everything else. How do you go from being the asshole who lightly roughs up women to hopping around like that to that chant? By the way, this is not the first time a chant like that has happened at a wrestling show. After a god-awful amount of stalling, Steve and the Smoke formally announce their war on hoes. Really, the guys who act like this make their hatred of women openly known? Never would have pegged them! The announcement seems to have incensed BJ to the point where she storms the ring and attacks Steve for it, only for her to be taken out by Corporal Punishment. A wrestler best known for his work in the Northeastern US, the current owner of MCW in Maryland, and the guy who got me booked on StarCast last year. The Bukaki Bob! The Bukaki Bob! Okay, really, Smoke? You gotta steal Devon Dudley's shit, too? Corp gets on the mic, calls the company Glow, and says he's there to rid the place of all the STD-ridden bitches. But suddenly, in comes this brand new woman we've never seen before, calling him a rooster filleting cigarette. Thank God for the lower third coming in to tell us who she is, cause no one else was doing that! She would be like what we like to call the girl that they did not inform me about tonight, Tara. After more talking, we get a match with the two. The corporal bumps his ass off for Angie and kicks out of about a dozen pinfall attempts before he ultimately swats her down and hits his bukkake bomb to win as the war on hoes continues. This whole segment began at the beginning of the paddle match and then went to the end of Corporal and Angela for a total of 31 minutes with the edits. Up next, Davey May calls the fans cigarettes more times than I can count as he issues an open challenge, only to be answered by Alexis Lurie. Even Tara, the heel commentator, doesn't think he stands a chance. Davey May thinks he's gonna get a piece of Alexis Lurie's ass? He sure does. <laughs> I don't know about that. One or two big moves and a fucked up count by Isis later, Alexis wins in quick fashion. But she can't celebrate for long as Simply Luscious shows up to challenge her to another match. This contest is far more competitive than the last one, and after a point I start to wonder if it makes Davey or Alexis look worse. Tara runs in at the end, but something goes horribly wrong because now everyone has to improvise a new finish. When that doesn't work, Lurie just vanishes from the scene, forcing Isis to start a 10 count as a show your tits chant build. Alexis re-enters the match and they go for another pin, but again it gets screwed up. The frustration on Alexis's face is very palpable, and now Luscious is the one who bails, and they call it. You know, shows like this prove you never know who's gonna make it. But never did I ever think that the WEW officials would send in a lesbian that would go down on me to win her match. Um, that's not a thing that happened in your match cameo, and... Didn't you call Persephone Persephilis? Or we wiped a Papa May who runs down G.I. Ho and guarantees a title victory for Dawn May. I will guarantee it! Then Missy the schoolgirl shows how hardcore she is by revealing her very small abrasions on her back. Damn, she really went through it. Back at ringside, Special Ed is upgraded from Chick Diesel to primetime Amy Lee, who runs down the crowd and accuses them of taking government checks, which isn't that the same reason we're supposed to be hating Special Ed right now? Come on, WEW, keep your moral compass straight. In comes Lucky, and second verse, same as the first, Ed and Amy Lee beat the bejesus out of him. Someone get Meltzer on the line because this shit right here is cinema. This awkward and cringy beatdown leads to a brawl with Lee and Riptide that goes into the crowd and ends in a double DQ for no flippin' reason, as a fan pinches Riptide's ass, then pours beer on them. Never change, dudes. So I finished my match here in WEW. Whoa, whoa, wait. Sorry, Alexis. Hate to cut you off there, but by any chance, was that half-second shot we just saw of the two black ladies meant to be the famous Ghetto Girls? If so, drink it in, because otherwise they are nowhere to be seen on this show. Good job, editors. There's a scene backstage where Lady Storm walks in on the smoke, who is holding a stripper shoe. The smoke was, hey, who Missy, is it? Missy gave the smoke, you know, a gift and, you know, but. A gift? What? Why would he just be carrying the shoe around? Like, if he had done something scandalous or disloyal, why would he just be walking around with this telltale clue of his infidelity? Like, what? We then wipe to another promo in the exact same location where Amy Lee challenges Riptide to a ladder match. If she has as hard a time handling the ladder in that match as she does here, it could be a long night. 
Then after another promo from Tara toward Casey slash Annie, we go to the main event of G.I. Ho versus Don Nay for the title. In a great way to close out a pay-per-view, we're treated to some exclusive fan cam footage of the match, which looks no different than the supposedly professional camera footage, and there's absolutely no commentary to speak of. We get yet another pixel cut, because if you're going to clip anything on this show, it should be the main event. The rest of the maze run in, which leads to a save by Ty Killer Weed as she soft serves those chair shots. After Ho wins the match, she's jumped by Christy Kiss of the PWO, who tears Ho's top off to reveal her pastied pubes. And once again, to drive home who's really the top babyface in the company, it's Ty who challenges G.I. Ho's assailant to a shaving cream match. After that, I'm gonna lick her. And I'm gonna fuck the shit out of her. Wow, a ladder match? A shaving cream match? and sex at the next show? Oh boy, they better follow through with these stipulations. Otherwise, the fans might lose faith in the product and stop going to the dive bar every month. By episode 7, the E in WEW is back to being extreme, I guess. This show is titled As Good As She Gets. Will we find out who she is tonight? We're back at Froggy's and Becky Bayless is here to spill some hot wrestle goss to Gargiulo. Uh, are you kidding? Eric, nice sell, but there is no way anything she's saying warrants that kind of reaction. Tara shows up and asks if we know who she is. And you know, after all this time, I still don't have an answer to that. Steve the Sound Guy shows up and heels on the heel. Everyone here in attendance and around the world knows that Britney has the best body. He said to zero reaction. But you won't be seeing Brittany here tonight, or Lady Storm, or The Smoke, as they're all apparently in Iraq, and we find out later that G.I. Ho's also there, so the title is held up. I get that the war just started around this time, so it was still pretty relevant, but like, really? All four of them went to Iraq? They take a plane together? So this chain-smoking schlub in the big tattered jeans and the wrinkled Mike Allstott jersey will be running things tonight. Tara wants to get the supposed best body contest underway, but first, here comes Annie Social again. She begins to strip and then just gets decked by Davey May. Amazing sell, by the way. The beating continues until Barroom Barbie, a.k.a. Bobcat, a.k.a. Pussy Willow, a.k.a. Al Snow's ex-wife, hits the ring to save the day, and the ring announcer could not give less of a shit. Ladies and gentlemen, the following contest is one fall. It oh, is it's about time. Style tag team match. We had the old ECW ring announcer the last show. What happened to him? Can we bring him back, please? Barbie foolishly says she wants to take on the two May boys all by herself, and the match is on. She rebounds off of Papa May's body. Meanwhile, the ring literally shifts when he splashes a corner. Jesus, this match is rough. Didn't Bobcat train an OVW? Inexplicably, the sound guy pushes Davey off the top rope, which allows Babs to win the match to no music and no pop. What in God's name is happening on this show? After some more promos and pointless segments from the Maze and Ty Weed, we cut backstage to Rip Ty just raging on a trash can when Amy Lee jumps her from behind, leading to a pull-apart brawl that we can hear at least one person off camera laughing at, which is fair since this might be the most random and hilarious thing on this show. I'm just getting started with that f***ing bitch! Ah! Oh, get on me! Ah! Well, watch camera, watch camera, watch camera! Isis is back out again for another dance routine. This woman gets more screen time on these shows than many of the wrestlers. Because her dance takes so long, we have to cross dissolve ahead to our next match, Persephone versus Psycho Bitch. Persephone is now accompanied by Special Ed, who has suddenly taken on a P.T. Barnum gimmick with zero explanation. It's not hard, guys! Highlights of this match include Barnum spanking his own client and Persephone botching consecutive crucifix attempts and a choke slam to rival The Undertaker and Hulk Hogan's in 2002 for Bitch to win. Sped slaps Psycho Bitch and gets a Muda handspring for his efforts, but is a able to flee as Lucky painstakingly enters the ring. At least that poor bastard didn't get beat up this time. That's right, I'll take you two little bitches on in hardcore rules. We now jarringly move forward to another handicap match. Whatever Rip Tide and Amy Lee were doing in the back don't mean jack now, as the former Prada Jet is now fighting two members of the ring crew who would later be known as J.D. Smooth and Funky White Boy in the Independence. The match is decent. Rip Tide isn't much, but she's a hell of a better worker than Bobcat. But this crowd is just dead unless someone gets hit in the balls or shows their tits. Rip Tide counters a double suplex into a double DDT to win the match. Simply luscious! And simply luscious means business. Hell yeah, now that's how you work the hard cam. 
time for a rematch between Simply Luscious and Alexis Lurie. I give Eric Gargiulo crap in these reviews, but I'll admit that he actually tries and works to put the competitors over when proper wrestling matches are happening and when he's not weighed down by Jeffrey J. James. Terra medals in their business once again, but at least this time it resulted in an actual finish as the distraction allows for Luscious to win with a super kick. Up next, local worker Mike Pava takes on some lady named Mercedes. No, not that Mercedes, or that Mercedes. In his opening promo, Pava talks about how he trained her to wrestle, but now is upset that she's wrestling people? Dude, pick a lane. I thought this was women's extreme wrestling. How extreme is this guy? But whatever do you mean, Eric? Can't you see his big cargo pants and his Hardy Boy shirt? During the match, the crowd calls Pava a cigarette while Gargiulo chimes in that his name does sound kind of fairy. All right, dude. Despite a couple of funny moments like Mercedes' very weak clotheslines, this match is one of the cleanest all show if you don't include whatever they cut out. She hits a nice looking powerbomb to win the match. Eric breaks down the rules of the main event, a battle royal to crown a new unified women's world champion. People are eliminated when they're thrown over the top or if they lose their top. He explains that the match will have a strap stipulation when it gets to the final four, which of course doesn't happen. Primetime Amy Lee is out first, who throws tampons out to the audience members. Honestly, it's probably the closest most of these guys have been to feminine hygiene products in their lives. She demands that the crowd have a moment of silence for the troops in Iraq, but when the crowd keeps shouting, she turns and says she hopes they all die. And if that's not enough heat, she concludes her promo by throwing a dirty tampon out into the crowd. No doubt an inspiration for Gigi Dolan years later. Sound guy comes out next as number two, and for once he doesn't attack another heel. They say the people will come out in 30 second increments, but it's definitely less than that as folks just start coming out one after the other with no breaks. By the time all the contestants have come out, we realize that like half of the folks in a match for a women's title are dudes. Everyone is selling like shit and dildos get thrown into the ring at one point, so of course it's time for the WEW theme to play on a loop, New Jack style amidst the chaos. Will it be Christy Kiss? Will it be primetime Amy Lee? Or will it be Steve the Sound Guy? One of the nurses pokes Sound Guy in the ass with a cigar, so he responds by decking her and the ref for some reason, who sells his shove like she took a sleeping pill. Sound Guy eliminates himself as Lee beats down Ty Killer Weed and puts her in the camel toe clutch. I guess submissions count now because Lee wins and is the new Woo Champion. But in the final twist, the show ends with a potential May family face turn as Papa and all his extra nipples attack Steve the Sound Guy with a stink face as the show fades to black. Well, I'll be damned. This company has some long-term storytelling after all. It's finally time for episode eight, or Hot Booties Get Kicked. Seriously, who is the genius naming all these shows? It looks as if we're back in the ECW arena for this one. No, wait, that's just the intro. It's still at the bar in Delaware. Well, that's messed up. The last few shows have begun with highlights from that same show, like a preview. So if they're kicking things off with Philadelphia footage, and that's not what we're getting here, then... Then what exactly are we getting here? The show begins with a promo gauntlet in the same spot in the venue. There are no fewer than three of them that involve an empty pizza box, which by the end I was certain was becoming a running joke for the wrestlers. I'm anti-social. Yeah, that's a version of anti-social. Wow, thanks for explaining that one to us, Annie. Candy is back and Tara shows up to conspire with her using a deadly form of baby powder. Navajo says that even though Simply Luscious is Mexican, she's white to her tonight. And finally, Amy Lee declares that Riptide is retired, G.I. Ho had to go, and tonight she will shove Ty Killer Weed up her own ass. Now that's something to see on pay-per-view. <laughs> Oh man, you all thought it was a lady dancing, but it was a dude. <laughs> Gay. We go to ringside for the opening match of Candy versus Angela with Tara as the special guest ref. The commentary team goes through a big shakeup as Becky Bayless and Pussy Willow, who was Barroom Barbie one show ago, are on the call. And they are horrible. Some of the action coming up here tonight, you wouldn't even believe it. I couldn't even tell you what's coming up. Is that a sleeper hold over there? Like an STF. Oh uh, no, it looks like kinky sex, but. <laughs> I talk, it's what I do best. I have the gift of gas. Obviously, that might have to do something with your heritage, but I ain't kidding. Look, I am proud to be a Yenta. Oh, a punch to the face. Oh, ow, oh, ow, oh, ow, oh, ow, oh, ow. Oh. He is unloading on antisocial. Yeah, that's what I told me, unloading. <laughs> uh. Look, it takes a real man to admit when he's wrong. Eric and Jeffrey, Please come back. 
The match itself isn't much to write home about. The insurance policy backfires, but Tara is still able to count the three as Angie picks up the win. We then cut backstage to find the smoke is back and promising someone beans and rice. Smoke promises beans and rice if you got them that part for all. What? Ty Killer Weed screams her lungs out at Amy Lee. Then we go back to the smoke who introduces a big former WCW star. WEW has one of the most quintessential beauties of the wrestling business today. Oh, you guys, Gorgeous George is here? Oh my God, that's a sign that's gonna put WEW on the map, baby. Mercedes takes on Persephone next. Special Ed is in Persephone's corner and is traded as P.T. Barnum look for clothes made from a shower curtain. He gets involved in the match, which leads to Simply Luscious chasing him out of the ring, but Persephone wins regardless. I'm so confused. Wasn't Luscious a heel before? Is this just some weird all-tweener promotion or what? You know, Gargiulo is technically more polished than these two, but I will give them credit for the term handyman. As we go to the next match between Davy May and Baby Fat, we hear someone from the back talking to the announcers regarding a change in the lineup as well as some broadcasting tips. Just some notes to remember. Don't try not to talk over each other. If someone shoot a promo when they're in the ring, try not to talk over them. You can make comments, but don't let them get a promo. And how much do you want to bet that those two took those notes to heart? The supposed new babyface, Davey, starts the match off by grabbing Baby Fat's boobs and grinding against her butt. The camera work is also some of the most blatant we've seen this whole run as it keeps cutting to Isis and Baby Fat's asses during the match. It's another hard one to get through. They botch a cross body spot, and of course the commentary doesn't know what to make of it either. Oh! I don't know what to call that. That was a side slam. Sometimes you see stuff here that looks like kind of movie. You never know what it is, but you just go with it what you think it is. Davy hits his version of the boob plex, but isn't done with the match. Suddenly the smoke arrives to cost May a victory, so I guess the face turn is confirmed. Always good when a heel costs a face a match against another face. Wow, what a cartwheel! The announcers are noticeably slurring their words a third of the way in, as we have Simply Luscious taking on Navajo, who was actually a referee at the last show. Luscious brings out the Exotico ref from earlier, whose name is Cha-Cha, apparently. Time to talk to the producer again. Tell her they're in my bag. They're in my bag. They're in my bag. They're in my um, bag bag. So you don't want to make any mid-match cuts here, for instance? Bobcat tries to make the same Thanksgiving dinner joke twice as Luscious makes her comeback and wins the Death Valley driver. Naturally, commentary has no clue what just happened. See, I'm just paying too much attention. Was that it? Was that three? I don't know. That was three. Simply Luscious. I was talking about myself again. In comes Persephone and Special Ed again, who get their heat back against Simply Luscious for earlier. At this point, why doesn't just everyone hang out at ringside to take turns interfering in shit? Psycho Bitch handily defeats the two ring crew guys in a handicap match. Then we get the big payoff to the story from earlier as Persephone Ed take on Simply Lucky. It's bad enough to see Persephone have to bump and sell for Lucky's one-handed shoves, but they have a kissing spot as well? In the end, Ed slaps Luscious. She gives him an airplane spin. Lucky just collides into his rival and they both fall down. The pin, the win, fuck all this show. I am so turned on right now, I'm about to play with myself. <sighs> Jesus, even at its worst and most depraved and desperate, ECW was 10 times better than this. We cannot get to the end of this show fast enough. Antisocial, which did you know was a play on the word antisocial? Interrupts the smoke, so Smokey drops her and begins to choke her with a mic cord. Watching this match, it looks like Smoke's shoes are bigger than Annie's head. Oh, and here are some close-ups of Cha-Cha's ass for equality. Annie somehow no-sells the Smoke's elbow and punches him in the dick, followed up with a terrible split leg drop and the win. <sighs> Almost there, folks. It's time for the return match for the WEW title, pitting arguably the promotion's top face and top heel in Ty Killer Weed and Amy Lee. Ty says she wants to wrestle Amy, not brawl, which is a terrible idea as neither women are particularly good at wrestling and Lord knows that's not what the crowd came to see. It's especially maddening to see Lee have to bump on the lockup from her much smaller opponent. Pussy Willow's MIA on commentary from most of the match, but makes it back to argue about nothing just as the fight predictably makes its way to the crowd. The smoke gets involved, the sound guy gets involved, Ty is put through a table and loses via camel toe clutch. But then the maze run back out and helps save the day. Honestly, if this storyline reveals that the Mays grow pot and that Ty is their biggest customer, that would be amazing. And so ends this pay-per-view. Oh, wait, that's right. The real main event's an evening gown match with Pussy Willow and the former Gorgeous George.
Yay. Though considering how George once worked a WCW pay-per-view and Bobcat is a former WWF hardcore champion, that makes this the biggest match in WEW history. Oh, you know what though? There was King Sleazy earlier. I'm WW's hot, totally sexy woman. You tell him, P-dubs. With a whopping three minutes left in the show, the match finally begins. The two crumble into each other, and yes, of course they clip the match featuring by far the most famous person here. We get the logo censoring the goods for modesty, which had to infuriate all the horny 13-year-olds who bought this on DVD. An absolute chaos takes over the ring as the show finally, mercifully, comes to an end. At this point, what do you want me to say? What final declarative statement could I possibly make that could succinctly sum up the last 12 installments of this poorly aged, poorly booked, poorly produced, poorly edited, absolute garbage? Now that I think about it, the last sentence I just said perfectly sums it up. Wrestling is nothing if not a reflection of where we are as a society, and well, it's plain to see what American promoters thought of women in the early 2000s. It's kind of a wonder that women's wrestling here was allowed to evolve at all from this point, and it's a testament to some of the best workers at the time that they stuck it out and helped usher in a better era for women in the squared circle. WEW certainly crammed a lot of content into these 90-minute adventures, but so much of it's disjointed and painful to watch on so many levels. From changing the name of the company back and forth, promising things and constantly failing to deliver, awful production, and failing to include any kind of background let the audience know why we should care about any of this, there's a lot more bad than good here, though I will admit there is some good if you dig deep enough. Regardless, I get the idea that WEW is not a product meant to be marathon, especially while sober. So in that sense, I suppose I should be saying, you're welcome for my sacrifice. Thanks for watching everyone. Here's a list of all the lovely folks who contribute to Patreon every month and motivate me to keep watching terrible stuff like this. At the rate we're going, I'll probably see you for part four of WEW sometime in the next uh, five years, maybe? Ah, who am I kidding? Probably two. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.